Well, uh, Jillo again. This is uh, Buck Benny, and uh, welcome to another one of our uh, political podcasts. Uh, I guess we call it, well, what is it? Politically left, right, and wrong. Or wrong. <laughs> I think it's more wrong. Which really just sounds like you hate centrists. Yeah. <laughs> it does. <laughs> Well, and the fact that every time we come on, I'm always saying, oh, one of these days I'll find someone from the right. I think people are going to stop believing me very soon because I keep on running into more people from the left, but that's okay. So uh, it's great to be back here. Uh, Today we're going to cover Kamala Harris and uh, we're going to talk about uh, Biden's recommendation that uh, you wear masks for three months. Um, and we're going to talk about uh, Trump refusing to fund the post office and some other things. If we get to other things, we'll cover as much as we can. So that's some of the stuff we'll cover. Uh, if, if you're listening to this as a podcast, those subjects might be broke over the course of the week. If you're watching this as the YouTube, then it'll all be covered today. So there we go. So we'll, we'll go to the first, well, first we'll introduce everybody. So I've got Alicia, she's, uh, yeah, wherever she's waving from. I don't know when the recorded <laughs> work will be, so I can't really tell you. And then I have uh, Hunter over there. And uh. <laughs> yes, <laughs> and Hunter is, has found a great program to use. Hunter, why don't we give a shout out to that program since, since it's uh, cool and unusual? Well, it is listed down there at the bottom left of my camera. It's Face Rig. Face Rig. Okay. So that is really cool that does that with Zoom. So that is awesome. I'm going to have to figure that out. And then uh, Alicia was so bright. She figured out immediately that I was in the background of Parks and Rec, which is pretty cool. So which uh, I thought it starred Joe Biden. Presidential. Yes. <laughs> Joe Biden was <laughs> on there. Yes. <laughs> so. He was a main character. Was he? For all I the know. seasons? <laughs> I don't know. I watched like a season. <laughs> okay. anyway let's get on with our podcast so uh this week of course and i just we did a podcast with with mindy yesterday and put it out there and it was about kamala harris uh, becoming the vice presidential choice that biden picked but i haven't had a chance to talk to about you guys with it um let's just get kind of your thoughts on it we'll go with uh I think Alicia's got a lot to share. So we'll go to Hunter <laughs> first and get his okay, thoughts okay. on it, and then we'll go to Alicia. Okay. So my very my first thought was, uh, why? Why Kamala? <laughs> uh, just because of the debates, uh, where that was something I loved about her in the debates, was how she was willing to call out Biden on his past, uh, you know, being a racist thing. His record, yeah. Yeah, his record, you know, supporting the bus, sick, not supporting busing, this whole thing. Right. Uh, but the way he responded to that and the way she responded to that for her being the VP pick of her, he wants her to be there to sort of like keep him accountable to his past, show him the correct way forward. That was That was a decent way of phrasing it. It still seems like he just picked her because he's like, look, I can't be a racist now. Uh Okay. I will throw in there that I don't think he was, uh, I doubt it was a real racist thing that he did when he was talking about busing. I think it was more giving into a lot of Segregationists. Well, (laughs) I wouldn't even say say segregationists. I would say folks didn't, well, on both sides, uh, a lot of black folks, a lot of white folks didn't want busing. Um, personally, my experience with busing was a really good experience in that uh, we had, uh, I didn't realize it at the time, I realized it years later, but we had uh, a really integrated, well, somewhat integrated uh, elementary school that I don't think I would have experienced just a few years before I went. I started elementary school in uh, 1969 and was going through the 70s into elementary school and uh, and we had uh, lots of students uh, with from lots of different uh, ethnic backgrounds and it it enriched me and and I think it helped shaped m- kind of my both my political views and my views of people and I and it gave me a chance to to uh, uh, I think I think have more depth in that area than than uh, some 
folks that went through a decade earlier and didn't get a chance to experience that. So um, I really like the fact they did that. Now, when I was in about middle school, they stopped doing that as much. And so we stopped having as much racial diversity, it seemed like, and that was too bad. But uh, anyway, so that's kind of my take on it. But Alicia, what do you think about uh, Kamala? Well, I agree with Hunter in that during the debates, a lot of my friends, you know, we were like, okay, she has like kind of a bad past as well, but like, it's nice to see her tearing into Biden. Um, I think we talked about it on the other podcast where Bernie is not great at attacking people. He just kind of says what he says and, you know, um, not in the, definitely not anywhere near as, um, point blank attack as uh, Kamala did. So that was really cool to see. And it feels a little No, wait, let me, let me stop you for just a second. You just said it was cool to see her attack. Was that cool? Are you saying cool to see her attack Biden when she attacked Biden or, or just since she's been uh, vice president, I mean, the nominee, I mean, she's going for vice president with Biden. She's been attacking Trump pretty much all day <laughs> and yesterday. Yeah, I which, mean, is that what you're talking about or which one are you talking if, about? Can I chime in for a second? Go ahead. That, that ability for her to attack, like she did an amazing job in the debates attacking. Yes. And that's going to be such a huge asset in the general because you know that's going to be, that's the whole Trump campaign thing. He's going to be attack, attack, attack. So it'll be good to have the VP that can do that right back, leaving mm-hmm. Biden open to talk about more policy and forward movement things and just sort of push the attacking off to the side and you know, sort of go, it's okay, uh, Harris, you, you, you go do the attacking, okay? <laughs> I'm going to be over here doing policy. You just like destroy Trump. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Have yeah. a nice day. I agree with that 100%. I think, I think she's going to be a real asset to him in that way. And it allows him to do the whole kind of Obama-esque thing of talking really positively, of talking about where he wants the country to go, uh, talking about, um, you know, like I say, a very positive message can come from him. And he's not bogged down with the attacks, whereas he lets her do the attacking for him. I, I just think that's a real, probably a real winning combination. Now they might, I assume some people might start attacking her and him by saying, well, that's exactly what's happening. But I don't, I don't think that'll make a difference. I think, I think people will go, yeah, that's, that's what's happening. And it's working really well. Alicia, you can finish off what you were saying then. Well, just what I was saying is the attack from like the, the far left is very um, like, oh, she's doing this as a career move. And um, she doesn't really seem to have her heart in the progressive policies that she's touting. But at the same time, um, I can't, blame her for a career move because i mean <laughs> how is she how is she going to make change if she can't get you know a decent long running career and so it's like i have hope i still have hope for her i know a lot of people don't i still have hope for her to be decently progressive but um and you know like i think i sent an article maybe you can link it somewhere but it was an article about uh, Kamala Harris talking about her past and uh, the way she grew up in a very progressive family and how like when she wanted to be a prosecutor, everyone was kind of just like, okay, why? (laughs) Um, And so that alone where it's like, it seems like she really had like deep, 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 deep in her heart, she has progressive ideologies, but she needs to make some concessions in order to move up the ladder and, you know, be able to put those out without getting kicked out of the DNC. <laughs> right, right. Um, well, so Mike, I have hope. I, I'm, I've still, uh, she was a very tough on crime attorney general, which yes. is Which also, great, you know, in my opinion. With the current climate, maybe taking on a cop as your VP will just drive you further away from the left's vote. Yeah, so this is a thing that Daryl uh, kind of called me out on on Mindy's <laughs> podcast. Is he is like, I don't see Kamala as a cop because she's a prosecutor and she was a attorney general, but that is a part of the system of mass incarceration. Correct. And so she gets grouped into the cop thing. Yeah. But 
Yes, she not wasn't technically actually a out cop, there hitting people with but... batons. <laughs> yeah, exactly. She didn't knock people down and put on handcuffs on them or anything like no, that. No, she was out there not prosecuting the people that were hitting people with batons. Right, right. And that's the concern, right? The concern, yeah. is, and especially, I mean, it, it's a, I don't want to say it's a minor concern. It's less of a concern when she's going for vice, the vice presidency because the president is in charge of police and the whole thing. But my concern is she better use this time as the vice president, if she becomes vice president, to show us and make it really clear as to where she stands. Because it, this is the one issue that she seems to be on the wrong side of. Um, at least as far as the folks that would normally support a democratic ticket and and she'd better make it clear where she stands because at this point as she was president i think a bunch of us would be going i don't know what's she gonna do is she going to uh say you know what well one thing we know she voted on just a few years ago i think 2015 was that police shouldn't have to use their body cams or have body cams, I think it was. Um, and that's a pretty uh, major issue. And, yeah. And, and, and we really, um, the left anyway, highly believes that, oh, yes. that they should have body cams and that it's one way to keep them accountable and they should keep the things on all the time. Um, but anyway, and Hunter, you realize you're moving things all over the screen that we can see, right? Uh, now I can't even see your face. <laughs> well, listen, I was just getting stuff prepped for future segments. Okay. okay. <laughs> so I have a question. Um, Sorry about that. I that. want to talk about. Um, so when we talk about Kamala, she is very strong. And if Biden does get elected, I have two questions right here one of which is how what do you think the future of the democratic party is going to look like if biden does win right. as in are we going to see kamala uh either run or win in the next election right. um also what kind of vp do you think she's going to be those are questions to me or to us Hunter. Anyone, anyone answer. <laughs> okay. okay, well, I will say this. Um, last week when we talked and I said that I thought Susan Rice would probably win uh, because I thought that Biden would go to his comfort zone and I thought she would be within his comfort zone. I didn't really realize the relationship that Kamala had had with uh, Biden's son and that they were really close. And I think that goes a long way towards a loyalty issue with, with Biden of saying, well, if she was close with my son, then I need to, then I'm loyal to her or that sort of thing. I mean, I think he, he's big on family. He's, so it makes sense that he picked her for those reasons, but also uh, since he picked her just in the last, just in the last, what, day and a half, I guess, or whatever it was, um, she has really shown, she's really come out of the box strong and made me see yeah, I don't know if anybody else he would have picked could do this and take Trump right on hard. And yet when she does it, I, you don't get that feeling of, oh, she's being, you know, too harsh. It's like, no, no, she's doing She, it. she doesn't oh, come really. off as vindictive. Yeah, she does not. She does not. And, and that's she, it's not, yeah. it feels like she's just calling him out rather than just trying to hurt him which is definitely more of what you want to go for. Right. Very calculated. Yes. But I think I I think she ticked off all the boxes that he was looking to to do. I think there's just a lot of things that um that I think she is a good fit for and he probably made Overall, if you look at all the things that it could be, maybe he made about the best choice he could if he's looking to just who can help him to win, right? Yeah. Um, not If he was looking to who can reach out to the left, that was not the best choice. <laughs> no, but then you'd have to go with Warren, choice. but... Yeah. 
I think Harris was overall the best choice he could have made. Yeah. Because I think if he like we said, Warren, if he's not going for the left, he's going for the left. Better choices, but he's trying to go for the moderate appeal, trying to get some sort of on the edge Republicans that are going for Trump, maybe to switch over. Yes. And for that, Harris is a was the best way to go. I think also probably he was a little concerned about at least some of the things he's said in the past couple of weeks that have made uh, some of the black voters probably like hmm. I mean, that whole thing he said about uh, Latinos having a lot of diversity, a lot more diversity than, than, than the black voters. I mean, that, I, and he said it a couple times. It's like, that, why and they the, get these things yeah. in their head and think, oh, this is a good thing. I said that before. I'll say it again to this group. And, and like, this whole, you're not black you're if you don't, don't vote for me. <laughs> what was that? And this whole, you're not black if you don't vote for me line. Yeah, correct. Which was, I mean, all that adds up. And yeah. so, so I, he had he had to save face somehow. Yeah, I think Kamala goes. And a long it's just way. great. Yeah, this is great that Kamala was both helping him save face on that, and was also a great pick for the attacks that we discussed and some policy. Yeah. So I think that was. I mean, he was left with pretty much, it not making much sense to go with anybody but her. So yeah, Alicia, um, you said which I loved. You said you still have hope that she will uh, become the can a candidate that you can what totally support. Get support. <laughs> yeah 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 in the long run and everything and uh and i agree with that i'm not i'm saying that she's uh I, i'm going wow she seemed like a really she seemed like a decent pick when he made it and now the past day and a half has made her seem even like a better pick but we're not going to know until we get closer and see her perform more but I'm getting more hopeful that, that she might be um, a really solid pick for him that really helps him out. Uh, then, then the other piece you said is you were talking about the future of her being, whether she becomes a presidential candidate in, in 2024 or whether she becomes a candidate candidate in 2028. Um, so, yeah, yeah, so let me, so this is a, um, I don't know if it's as much of a joke on the left right now or uh, something this has just been talking about something that's been floated but a lot of people on the left at least um think that joe biden is going to just drop at some point um not die <laughs> <laughs> um you know preferably not die but yeah. um you know just hand the presidency over to his vice president you, and i think you're saying hang on for just a second you're yes. saying after he becomes president, you're saying he's going to yes. run after he becomes president that folks are saying that he's just going to say, this is too much for me or whatever. And yeah. pass it on to her. It's to kind of president. like, um, people are like, Oh, how many years do you think it's going to take before he just hands the presidency over? And I think, um, one of our comments on one of our YouTube videos talked about how whoever is the VP is going to be the president. Right. Um, you know, whether because that's some type of mental decline on Joe Biden's part, or if it's just that he's like, you know, you can handle certain things that I'm not as experienced in, or like I'm not up with the times with. So it's just trying to figure out, uh, do you think that they're, that the DNC is going to take her and put her, is she going to be the face of the Democratic Party now? No. <laughs> I think, I, I will tell you what I think is going to happen. Uh, because uh, I'm building on my track record I've established by saying Susan Rice was going to be the vice presidential candidate, uh, which uh, was, as we know, was totally correct. And so... You're spot on as always. You're spot on, spot on. So I'm going to Got say it. that barring some sort of illness, some sort of uh, health situation that makes him have to give up the presidency, I'm going to say he's going to run uh this time win maybe hopefully um Ideally. and then he's going to um next time he's going to be probably doing a little uh, not much hemming and hawing but sort of leaving that those things open and then uh, about two years before he's going to totally commit and say yeah he's going to do it he's going to run again and so he's going to run for the eight years and then uh, Kamala will definitely be running 
I think, in 2028, right? Yeah. So, so you think it'll take much longer for her to kind of rise to the top than a lot of other people are thinking? I would No, I wouldn't say it's going to take her time to rise to the top, but I'm going to say you can't rise to the top unless the top guy steps out of the way. <laughs> yeah, I, yeah, I, I don't gonna, get the feeling that Biden's going to want to step down unless it's some severe health reason. So you agree with me? Yeah, I... Which is rare. I don't think it's going to back. It, this is true. <laughs> this is true. <laughs> I like this. No, I, I just don't. I, I think all might be for different reasons. President are ambitious, and he has run for president so many different times. Yeah. He finally, is going to have it. I don't see him go. Oh, I'm just too tired. I'm not going to do it anymore. I mean, I, I just don't see. I mean, unless it is way more taxing than he thinks it's going to be. Um, I can't imagine him watching Obama age in the way that he did in his time in office and thinking that it's not going to be taxing. Correct. But he could be watching Trump playing golf and be going, hey, I can do <laughs> yeah. that. Hey, there's not much work here. It's a lot more cool. relaxing than I thought it was going to be. I mean, Biden might go down, down to Mar-a-Lago every uh, weekend and <laughs> just relax down there. Who knows? <laughs> but yeah, the presidency, whew, that's a big toll. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Just, just look at, look at this, okay? Let me see if I can do a little bit of a movie magic here for you. <laughs> You're amazing over there. Oh, Who's thank you. Talking as you do your magic. Okay? Oh, go for it. <laughs> I was gonna move on to the postal service. Sure, let's do, presidencies. It. let's do it. Um, do you have a movie before we switch over topics? She's asking you, Hunter. Me? What? <laughs> <laughs> I was just going to pull up images. I was going to pull up a before and after image of Obama in the presidency. Oh, okay, yeah. Well, we'll move on from there. Speaking of the presidency. Yeah, we'll, just, we'll just move on. Tell us when you're ready. Speaking yeah. of the USPS. This Speaking is, of the presidency, yeah. I like the way you can have graphics that you put Oh, up. I'm adding so much production value to this. <laughs> <laughs> this is incredible. Should have had me on this way earlier. I now have both a special effects budget and I also have graphics ability. So it's just yeah, look at this. You got weird furry John Oliver over here. That's great. <laughs> well, you almost look like Rocket in some ways, but not. Yeah, quite. that's what I said. Some strange. Probably because of you know it being a ferret. Yeah. <laughs> a uh, raccoon. Well, <laughs> it looks like a fox. It is actually a red panda, if I paid any attention to what it was. <laughs> Here, I can, I, can, I, can, I can go more rocket if this helps. Oh, you know, that's that, weird. That's fine. But you realize a bunch of people are listening going, we don't want to hear what he looks like when <laughs> we're not watching. You oh, can edit part of this out. <laughs> and this is an ad, too, for YouTube. Come to YouTube and watch yeah. it here, and then you can actually see what Hunter looks like in his cool little uh, this character. This is true. His avatar is awesome. Um, but we were we were moving over to the uh, voting and and the uh, mailing in your votes and things. Trump this week has doubled down on the fact that and just come out and basically said it today that uh, he just thought that uh, if 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 we, he has if he allows the voting to come in, he thinks uh, as mail-in votes he believes that it is going to. Uh, be fraudulent and that that by allowing this by allowing the the postal system to step up to be able to handle it that he's going to be adding to the fraudulency of the whole election now um, you have with without any facts whatsoever and I I will say I have been really impressed with this as I've seen it covered on every station I've watched on television they keep on saying, after they say that he believes it's the fraudulency of the whole thing, they will say with, and he has no facts to support that. Yeah. Um, they're really yeah. good about pointing out the fact that, that there's nothing there. And, uh, and there was a court case somewhere today I read about where uh, the judge has said, you folks, I've asked you, I've said, you know, show me your show me your your data that shows how how there's uh, fraudulent voting going on, and they wouldn't show him that data. So now he's saying, no. Now I'm demanding you show me that data for us to continue this court case, because they have a court case apparently against yeah. uh, voting in some way and saying we shouldn't 
do mail-in voting in a, in a state. They have to go like in a state-by-state state way. But what do you guys think about this whole situation? Um, I, so it seems like what he's doing is he, you know, tried to stop the mail-in voting. Uh, and as soon as he realized that that was not something that he could do, he just went straight to defunding the post office. Which is so stupid because the post office is used for so much beyond just the voting. Yes. Agreed. It's, and it employs a tremendous amount. Oh, it does. Yeah. And, and the, it's the, it's, uh, we can't depend on like UPS to cover. UPS isn't going to deliver to just the middle of nowhere. It's not economical for them. Right. We exactly. need the USPS to keep the country connected. Well, and a number of the Republicans over the past number of years have made an argument to not have a postal system and have a private company take it over. But it has been that's said just working that, so well with healthcare. <laughs> well, right, and they—they, they, I mean, Republicans generally don't think. That yeah. They want to keep government small. They believe that the that having um, companies take things over is a better way to go. But services but, like this that are essential and not economically viable require government intervention for them to function. That is perfectly stated. Nice job. <laughs> I wish you. I could say it that clearly. Thank you. Um, that is pretty impressive. Coming this is the one topic I prepared for. A red, <laughs> whatever you want. So, and, uh, I, uh, what I was going to say about it was, every company that's looked at into it to, to try to take it over has said they, they have no problem. They, they will deliver mail and do it as well as the U S postal service, maybe even better. Uh, but the price will go up. It'll, it'll, it'll be two or like one or $2 a letter instead of, you know, whatever we're paying now, 60, I don't even know what we're paying now. But anyway, uh, but they've also said that they will, but they will do that for, they'll cover 75% of Americans. The other 25%, they'll do it, but it's going to cost like $7 a letter or $10. I mean, it's because it is hard to get out to all these little small rural places. And the Postal Service can do it. They can have that happen. We can uh, give them... Uh, we can make it where they, they have to do that. And, and it's worked for years. So uh, going away from it is going to be a very harsh thing if we do that. And, and they're saying, well, it doesn't really matter because most people have email and so forth, but a lot of people don't. And yeah, exactly. And especially in the rural part of America, there's people that just don't, they don't have the Wi-Fi and everything else that they can have and Comcast and whatever they need to connect up. And, uh, it's it's just really sad if that's what's happening. Also, it's sad, like I say, getting rid of all these employees that that uh, that they'd have to get rid of. So, hopefully, they get the funding going again for. Uh, but it makes a concern. I mean, does it make you guys concerned as far as uh, are there going to be enough ways to get in mail-in voting from all the states that need it, and are people going to be able to be safe and all of that? I mean, oh, of course it's concerning. <laughs> this will butcher mail-in voting. This will most likely get rid of it. Yeah, I, I think he you know. knows that, and yeah. that's kind oh, of yeah, why that, he's pushing for it. It's the, only, the only reason he hates USPS is because of mailing and Amazon, which the Amazon hatred doesn't make sense because they pay to ship their packages. They're not getting free shipping through USPS. Right, right. Sorry, that just annoys me whenever he brings it up. Yes, and I get that. I got that. Um, I... The other thing I was going to say, though, is when you say that it'll get rid of mail-in voting, as far as Washington goes, and I don't know what other states are doing this and to what level they're doing it, okay, it'll... Washington does a pretty good job of having drop-off boxes where you can drop off your vote, put it in this box, essentially like a, like a ballot box used to be, and you drop it off in there, and you don't have to mail it, you don't have to rely on the... So it, okay, it'll still exist just to such a, a significantly smaller amount. And all for, I mean, it, this, like we said, voter fraud through mail-in voting is not something that's practical or it just doesn't happen. 
Yeah. The percentage so that it happens is, at is like point zero zero zero. Oh yeah. All this is is just voter suppression because, as we've seen, uh, the more people who vote, the more likely it is that a Democrat will win. So voter ID, no mail in. That's all just entirely just about getting the Republicans to stay. Right. It's interesting though that that a decent amount of Republicans are actually coming out against Trump and saying that, no, the postal system needs to be funded. And so this is, yeah. So this is something that I was thinking about is I would be really interested in seeing, uh, you know, what the so-called silent majority uh, middle of America has to say about this, because they're the ones who would be most impacted by it. I mean, I would be fine <laughs> personally. <laughs> I mean, like it wouldn't affect me personally, right. but I still care about it because all these people living in rural America who might be voting for Trump, who are probably voting for Trump, how do they feel about this? Like how, they would this, probably is, this like is taking to get away mail. a huge method of communication. Yeah, I agree with Hunter. They would probably like to get mail. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, yeah, you can find USPS that will like, they get people like walk into canyons to get people their mail. Yeah. USPS ain't gonna send someone through a canyon unless you give them like an extra 200 bucks a package. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, you want to send a letter to Grandma Jimmy? Oh, that'll just be uh three hundred and fifty dollars. Sorry, she's out of your network. <laughs> yeah, it's it's just gonna turn into another. Like we know what happens when um, you know government run things that could be government run are instead privately run. It's privately run for profit, but not everything Tolerance. can be made for profit. As you said before, yeah. not everything can be run for profit, and when it is, it's at the detriment to a lot of people. Agreed. Agreed. Um, I thought, I was just thinking that uh, when I introduced Hunter, I never said what his age was, and you can't really tell by looking at his character what his age is, so I thought I'd better say. Uh, we know that Alicia, she's joined us last week, of course, did a brilliant job, and she's back again this week. She's 19. He's a child. <laughs> yes. Hunter, One month until... Hunter is 20, <laughs> so, so Hunter is a whole year older than Elysia, supposedly. He's like six months older. Yes, yes. I know, you're so young. <laughs> when you reach my age, you'll gain true wisdom. <laughs> and I believe they say that women mature faster than, than men generally, so I would say she's probably comes across as older than you <laughs> in most ways. Also, the fact that she doesn't have a character on the screen <laughs> there as well. <laughs> Listen, okay? She's just, you're just jealous that I can do this. I know, you can actually do some dance moves and stuff. That is awesome. Dad. Uh, you see, YouTube, oh. you're gaining a lot that are audio people are not gaining right now. Oh, yeah, you can cut a lot of the, his little segments out. <laughs> I probably will. We shall see. Understandable. Um, are we are we good for leaving uh, this topic, or do we have anything more to say on it, or anything? <laughs> Go ahead. Just in general, we got some it's comments terrible. about vote for mail on our last podcast, okay. um, and I just want to say I am working on answering all the comments <laughs> on uh, the videos that involve me. Because I just want the research to be out there because there is research uh, pertaining to almost everything that we talk about. And if there's not, I will, I'll say that there's not. <laughs> uh, specifically, You're I willing to redact mail. your statements. Yes. Yeah, I will, I will redact my statements. I will hold it up as an opinion and not a fact. And but that is when it comes journalism. to vote, for, vote by mail, there is so much research defending it. And that is not, uh, you know, overly fraudulent and they're like you know it's it's slightly more voter fraud than usual and there's usually barely any <laughs> so if well, you look go, at the let's go with this for just a second since you're mentioning that you're going to respond to these things and of course i'm not going to respond to these things <laughs> but it's Alicia usually a general a rule on youtube to not respond to do that even better than i can and I, and I mentioned it uh, on one of our podcasts last week where I mentioned that she's going to UW and she's majoring. Well, not ma I said she's a politi in the political science area, but I don't know. Are you majoring in political science? Are you uh, 
I, I don't know how that goes with you. I'm majoring in law and policy. Okay. So it's a very like, it's a funnel into local government, basically. <laughs> okay. And you have helped a few people in their campaigns. Uh, yeah, I've talked to them about um, just various things. Yeah, I, I'm like a consultant. <laughs> okay. I, I'm not getting paid for it though, so yeah. I can't I can't say it. But uh, no. I've talked to a few candidates, and because I am in um, do you want like to student organizations either? that do talk to a lot of candidates around uh, our area. So when they talk to us, I'm like, hey, like. Maybe you should try to change the wording on this thing that you're saying because it's like cutting off some type of people. Yeah. Any any candidates that you want to give a shout out to that say, hey, they're still running and you might think about voting for this person or anything? Or Right now um, in Washington, uh, Beth Doglio is running in Washington's 10th district. Okay. She's, she, I think she like just, uh, she was endorsed by Bernie, first of all, so that tells you a lot. Yeah. <laughs> um, I think she's really great. She's got her head on her shoulders. She was, um, she was our state representative, I believe, okay. um, for the past however many years. And she's just now throwing her hat into um, federal office. Yeah, yeah, right. So I'm looking forward to seeing how her campaign plays out. Um, I can't remember who she's running against right now, but her, um, I think a lot of my candidates, I only had a few, but a lot of them ended up, uh, you know, not meeting the deadlines. They are all very progressive, <laughs> but yeah. Beth Doglio is the one who's who's made it as far as, you know, she can in this state. Whatever um, happened to Joshua Collins? That was a, okay, that's a whole other episode. He, he, listen, <laughs> I know he, he went in a tailspin near the end. Yeah. But did he end but, up making it just out of curiosity? No, that's why I'm endorsing okay. Beth Oglio right now instead of him. I think he <laughs> dropped out. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Well, and I'd be happy to do an episode talking about anything you want like that, that you'd like to share information about if you'd like. On the other hand, I don't want you to share anything that you could have people hold against you and not take you on a, on their to support their team because they feel like you're talking, you know, behind people's backs or anything like yeah, that. Yeah, I so mean, I'll, I'll you're talk. Gonna have to figure out what you think is okay and what's not okay, because we're fine with whatever. We yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll figure it out for okay. a future episode. Oh, good. <laughs> okay, so did you have a topic that you wanted us to cover, or did you want me to do some more of mine, or did you, or did that, I don't, I don't know if we covered the stuff you wanted to. Um, how long has this been running, first of all? How much more time do we have? We have a lot more time if you want it, so we're good. Okay, so... Um, one thing that I was gonna, that I did want to talk about, did you want to talk about something, Hunter? Or were you uh, just raising your avatar's hand for no reason? Listen. <laughs> <laughs> I was just, I messed up. I was trying to get rid of the USPS picture because we moved on. Oh, <laughs> uh, okay. Feel free something to leave it there or move it. <laughs> but at least you will talk. Go ahead. That, oh. Um... This has more to do with Kamala than it does with uh, the presidency or USPS. But sure, sure, sure. a really interesting thing that has been happening, been happening since the debates, is uh, just complete uh, coverage of, I guess, I'm trying to figure out how to word this exactly, uh, huge media coverage of Bernie Sanders supporters being rude, basically. Yes. Um, um, you know, they they act like Bernie Sanders supporters are on Twitter, like cyberbullying every other candidate, which I mean, happens. Yeah. <laughs> but the K-Hive or Kamala Harris's um, supporters. What's Bernie's called? Huh? Bernie's are called Bernie Bros. Bernie yeah. Bros. So Bernie the Bros. Bernie Bros and the K-Hive. Are the, are the a kind of aggressive supporters of Bernie that yeah. sometimes come out against people and, and maybe push things further than some people might be comfortable with. Yeah. yeah. And the K Hive is Kamala's equivalent of the Bernie Bros in some ways. Yes. I would say both of them are technically just fan base names. There so I wouldn't say that they're all just like these are the bad ones. Right. Um but it's uh each sex each one of those fan bases has very um 
I guess, very distinctive, uh, vindictive members who would be on social media and would be very rude. <laughs> um, and the reason that I personally wanted to bring this up is because I feel like it's interesting the coverage of Bernie Sanders supporters as, uh, you know, just Bernie bros who were cyberbullying everyone and the K-Hive as, you know, just really passionate supporters who are a team uh, like um, almost a weapon that uh, Kamala can use right. where, you know, Bernie, as we know, had to kind of disavow a lot of his followers like, hey, 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 I didn't support this. They're doing right. this on right. their own. Right. Well, I so, assume if the K-Hive does something that is not good or something that pushes things too far, she'll have to disavow some of the K-Hive stuff eventually too. Possibly. Well, they, they but both, so both... <laughs> That's an interesting thing you've got going on there. Uh, <laughs> there, you go, there you go, Hunter. That's, that's good. I like the graph. Um, so something that I think is bad uh, is doxing. Um, yeah. If you don't know what that is. Why don't you um, explain what it is so we know? Yeah, I'm going to explain what that is. Uh, doxing is basically when you, uh, somebody comments something, uh, tweets something to you, set, posts something on Facebook, something on social media. And then the readers of that go through that person's post history, go through like trying to kind of FBI their way through this person's account, figure out who they are, and then post their work address, their home address, connections that they have with various uh, institutions um, in an attempt to usually get them fired from their job or um well, where do they get the name doxing is that because they're dumping a bunch of documents about the person that's where documents is where doxing comes from or do you know where that terminology comes i'm not really from? sure it's something that has been around since i was a like a young teenager okay but i'm not exactly the term sure dox where it came from. derives from the slang dropping docs which according to wired writer matt honan was an old school revenge tactic that emerged from hacker culture in the 1990s. Thank you, Hunter. Yeah, that, there you go. <laughs> it's amazing you had that information just off the top oh, of Oh, I'm, I'm a genius. It's yeah. very true. <laughs> so, yeah, it's essentially, um, I wanted to connect this back to our cancel culture sure, uh, sure. discussion because what I was talking about in that episode was very like, okay, saying that this person is bad <laughs> yeah. and like talking about celebrities usually, yes. but doxing is something that can happen to just a normal person and right. is a lot more dangerous. Yes. Um, it's a tactic that's, I don't know if I would say popularized, but it's something that a uh, right wing area, uh, right wing um, spheres do a lot, very sure. far right wing, not just, you know, the average Republican, but right. far right wing people will just um, lists uh, a very addresses. recent example of this is someone is a I don't remember her exact role but she was very pro uh, defund the police oh I know what you're talking about yep I'm gonna it's I'm gonna censor the story a bit because it's bad. children yes it's bad uh, her address was doxed online and a person who did not support defund the police broke into actually he messed up and broke into her neighbor's apartment and assaulted who he thought was her so, so he, and he made a comment so, that was like mm -hmm. like you shouldn't you won't do that again or something that made yes. it very clear so because of so doxing it can lead directly to violence against people right. who are just trying to voice their opinions so doxing is pretty much I the believe, ultimate form of bad cancel culture. Yeah, so I believe the address was posted by like the police union of that. It was posted by a cop, yeah. Yeah, um, but they had the defense of like, oh, well, if they had looked it up, they would have found it anyway because she's a public official. Right. But, you know, it's still not great to list those houses. Um, this can also get into... Uh, protests that go by mayors or elective official, officials houses right. and it's been really big in the news of just being like oh they're 
they're walking past Jenny Durkin's house again, or they're walking past like this council member's house again. Right. And you know, that's so dangerous and they're in the neighborhood. And like, I am not a career organizer, so <laughs> I can't really say, but I feel like that's dangerous. Right. Um, just because it, you know, you might end up hurting somebody who's not the target of your uh, almost intimidation. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so well, I'm I'm a lot more neutral on that protesting technique than uh, a lot of other protesting techniques. But right. when it comes to regular person doxing, um, that is something that the K Hive and Bernie Bros I think both did. Mm -hmm. Specifically, I think it was um, there were plenty of them that happened where a student would get reported to the school to um, their college or something and in an attempt to like get them to lose their scholarship or to get them like, expelled from the school or something oh. and both sides did it and both sides were wrong to do that okay. but uh, Bernie bros were attacked a lot more viciously by the media than the K-Hive was. Okay. I think that's bad. <laughs> well I think maybe it's because Bernie was um, what considered a much more viable candidate, especially for some of the time he was for a little while there for a few weeks. And I think country remembers this pretty well. He, he was, was up there. He, he, oh, the golden he age. Thought, oh, he might just pull this whole thing off. And then all of a sudden Biden uh, started winning States and, and it, yeah, he won one like, state and everyone decided that he would be it. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, we remember. Right before oh, I, right? I remember the like brief, week like, two Tuesday, weeks. Uh, brief, like, I two weeks I had hope. Yeah. And then my hope got smashed. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yes. But, uh, but that's, that's why, and maybe they'll uh, be more on that. I assume there will be more on that. Uh, since now she's vice presidential candidate, I would think they would cover that more about the K-Hive and what they do. Um, and hopefully the K Hive mellows out because they don't. They got what they wanted. Yeah. 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 <laughs> or if, something if close to what out, they wanted, at they're least. They're going to get exactly what they don't want, which is people coming out more against her. And they that's not what they're looking for, I don't think. So, um, yeah, hopefully that taint calms down. All right. Um, it, it, did I cover that enough, or did you want to cover that some more? Oh, that's fine. I mean, I just wanted to say it. <laughs> it yeah, was no, just I, something that was on my mind. I, I wanted people very to look into to, it. Yeah, to say, to say, okay, well, if you've got issues with the Birdie Bros, you're probably going to have issues with the K-Hive and should. Yeah. Uh, you can't just say that the K-Hive Don't dox people. An altruistic <laughs> version of the, of the Birdie Bros. It's like, no, that's... Yeah, you need to look into both of them very carefully and figure out. Yeah, and be aware of the media bias. And also just, yeah, uh, like Hunter said, just don't dox people. That's bad. That's yeah. a good that's, step that's one. That's incredibly dangerous. If you, also, if you're doxing people, immediately your credibility goes way down. For whatever yeah. position you're trying to stand for, if you dox a random person or just a pro, another protester, if you do that, I'm going to go, well... Maybe you're on the wrong side of this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is, it, it's kind of like, it's an invitation to open violence against that person. Yeah. Right, right. Oh, you, you, the only reason you would ever publish someone's address is to go, hey, you can go threaten this person now. Yeah, What exactly. is a possible nonviolent reason to release the address of someone you oppose? Yeah. Yeah, there's no real reason for it except for hoping that something bad ha or people, I suppose you could hope people mail them letters. Or like, I don't know, go protest like outside their home, but then at the same point, like their family's there. Yeah, Do it's, it, like, it's, at it's their just work. incredibly dangerous. No, don't don't go to people's homes. Just a bad. Yeah, because it's, you know, it's a lot of like, well, you know, if they're Nazis, then. But, you know, there's there's neighbors. Right. There's neighbors that exist, yeah, and you, you might you know bash the bash. Yeah. We might have gotten you know one thing, one number wrong at the end of that. Um, oh, it's a huge you liability. You don't want to put you don't want to put people in danger. Like if you want to punch Richard Spencer uh, out in the street, I'm not going to say anything about it. But don't go to his house. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So what we're saying is, if you want to assault people, do it in public, not at their home. <laughs> 
That is the uh, message you I should get from this podcast. I release this is he, my podcast. Buck Benny <laughs> fully supports violence against no people what, in public. We support no violence. <laughs> like um, well, let's switch gears and go to uh, Biden came out today and said that uh, he's recommending that all 50 states go to a three month mask mandate where they mandate everyone wear masks for three uh, the next three months. And uh, one, do you think it's appropriate for someone running for president to come out and, and say something that, that goes against the sitting president? Um, or do you, do you think it's okay? Do you think it's not okay? What are your thoughts on this? I mean, it's definitely okay to say something against the sitting president. We've sort of been doing that for the past four years. <laughs> Fair enough. Fair enough. Um, but I, I would I would dovetail on that and say that also because this is public safety and and perhaps say trying to save lives, that it really makes it where it seems like an okay thing to do, um, and and. If it gets a few more people to wear masks and and keep people more people alive, well, that's worth it right there, to me. I don't know about for anybody else. But. It's for me. It's a question of um, how political are we going to make this? Because obviously, the politicizing of a health crisis is not great. <laughs> right. <laughs> because you yeah, know, why was this people. ever a political issue in the first place? Yeah, you know, it's it's a lot of reasons, but. Mainly, it was, um, uh, at, I think Trump just decided that it was a hoax, and then that spiraled into, you know, uh, in defiance of whatever overarching authority that you don't like. <laughs> um, so, and, and he has backpedaled on it. He has said, hey, maybe we should be wearing masks. And the only thing that I would be worried about right now is making him be like, well, if Joe Biden, like Joe Biden is saying that we should wear masks, but I don't think that we should wear masks. So I would worry about politicizing it further at the same time. And also like, it's not like he has uh, gubernatorial power right now to Correct. mandate right. those at all. So he's, he's just kind of saying it yes. to let people know that that's what he thinks. Where he stands and things, yeah. Yeah, that's where he stands. And I just think it's, you know, it's nice, but we kind of already knew that. <laughs> well, been... and Trump's announcement after the fact, responding to it, was that, well, that's not what the scientists say we should do. And which, of course, is incorrect <laughs> by every scientist I've ever heard of. Which scientist, Trump? Point me to the scientist. Yeah. Well, unfortunately, actually, no, he, he does have. Kind of off yeah. base, but. But uh, yeah, that's that's the thing. It, it it makes Trump double down on on. It doesn't make him rethink it and go, oh yeah, maybe that is a good idea. Um, that that's one of the problems. Um, another problem that uh, well, well, I see with Trump, just generally with this whole thing, is you were saying he's kind of backed down off of that stance that he had at the beginning. I would say yeah, he's kind of done that, but he's sort of wavered on it over and over again, and sort of acted like, no, I don't want to wear a mask and people shouldn't be forced to wear masks. And, you know, he's waffled on enough that it's, it's given support to folks that are saying they shouldn't wear a mask or they refuse to wear a mask or it's their right not to wear a mask, which of course isn't in the constitution. Yeah. <laughs> I can't remember which journalist it was, but Trump is just really good at providing statements and then not saying whether you should do it or not. Right. So, very, you know, very technically, people do have the freedom to not wear a mask. Yes. But on the same hand, I have the freedom to call those people bad people. Yeah. And also say... <laughs> and businesses, businesses have the right to refuse you service. Exactly. You do not get to get upset when your local Walgreens says you can't come in without a mask. Unfortunately, They sell medicine there. Yeah. Well, yes, they do, but they're also stupid for that. Okay. All right. Well, and uh, uh, the the other piece of this is it was just unfortunate. I, to me, I don't think Trump at the beginning was trying to really politicize it. I think at the beginning, he simply was talking off the top of his head, which he does 
more often than a president probably should, is he was just saying, well, yeah, they're telling us we should wear masks. I don't think I'm going to wear one. I think it would look strange if I'm meeting with some foreign leader in the Oval Office and I'm wearing a mask, so I'm probably not going to do it. And, and he was too proud to correct himself. To begin with, but then it caught momentum on the right and, and became this kind of rallying cry of, of, oh, we have freedoms and we shouldn't have to wear masks. You can't tell me what to do. And then Trump is trying to, he realized that's what the people are doing and he kind of supports them in it and says things to the effect of, oh, well, yes, well, they have rights and they can, and that's why we're not going to make it mandatory to do that, which again makes it seem like he supports not wearing masks. But then as they're finding more and more that and more people are dying, he starts saying, well, uh, you should, people should wear masks. Um, he said that a few times, but then of course he's, he's, he's backed off of that too. It's, it's, I don't know how anybody looking at what Trump has said over the course of time can honestly say a hundred percent where he sits with whether people should wear masks or should be able to not wear masks if they don't want to or whatever. Um, I, I don't know where he stands at this point. And I don't know on any given day where he stands unless he says what he feels like on that day. And then if he says it, I think there's a decent chance tomorrow he's going to say something completely different. Well, I don't know. Would you? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It, I mean, it's just, it's unfortunate that we, that he's, he's not clear on a lot of his stances. Right. Um, which makes it kind of hard to uh, disagree with him sometimes. Because you want to just be, and then it's just like, because you want to say, no, we should be wearing masks. And he's like, well, I never said that we shouldn't be wearing masks. Right, right. <laughs> I'm just saying that we shouldn't force them. So, yeah, but the problem is that his base has taken as him saying we shouldn't wear masks. So, without him directly saying, wear a mask, it's important, yeah. his base will keep going, eh. And the president weird. doesn't support I mean, masks. That- Joe Biden comes in when he's saying that we should have a mask mandate. It just gives his, uh, you know, Trump supporters be, be like, well, I'm not going to wear a mask. So I can own the libs. Yeah, right. Yeah, so that's, that's yeah, it, 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 you're right. It makes it, unfortunately, more political. But I do think it shows us where he stands, that he's saying, I am not, I'm going to be completely consistent and say that you should wear masks until this thing gets over with and it's the best way to stop so many people from dying. Uh, it will be nice to have a president with a consistent message. This is true. Yes. Yeah. Well, and we've had, um, I was just reading about it and I didn't realize, but we've had, uh, I think more, they were saying more days in a row of a thousand, over a thousand people dying a day than we've had in a long time. And that's, Sad. And yet it's so much less talked about now than when we first started. Correct. And we're going back to school. <laughs> oh, yeah. 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 Um, well, let's swap over to that topic. I wasn't going to talk about that, but I think maybe we should. <laughs> what, what do you guys feel about, because I mean, you're both college students. What do you feel about, one, yourselves going back to school and not going back to school? And what way is your uh, university going to deal with that? Two, what do you think in general about everybody? Should they be going back or shouldn't be going back? Or what do you think should be happening? So our university is going with the policy of every class has to at least offer a way to take it online. Mm -hmm. Most classes will be exclusively online. The only ones that will have in person are the ones that you can't really do online. So like lab lab science, labs, basically. But you're saying that, but, but even the labs have to provide a way that if a student says, I want to take this all online, that they, yes. wow, I wonder how they're going to do that. Do you know how they're going to do that? I It'll mean, there's probably not be like... much instruction for any of the online learning for any teachers <laughs> across, any teachers, professors across the nation. So that's a problem in itself. Um, I'm pretty happy with what what the university is offered us. I'm fine with not going back to school and not, because I mean, I get sick like every year just from the common cold. You know, I have like a month where I'm coughing. So I'm not looking, I wouldn't be looking forward to going back and have that be exacerbated by the fear of coronavirus. So I'm happy with that that decision. Um, 
I honestly don't think that anybody should be going back to school. I think it's a danger to students, the teachers, the parents. It all, it's also just so weird with all the schools that have opened and then they get like a case or two and then immediately close back down. What did you expect? Yeah, what was the point of spending all this time opening, having it, because it's cost, it costs money to keep the school open. Right, right. And you're well, just going to immediately. And then of course, the other concern too is if you open and somebody's grandparent dies because they got exposed to it because you were open, some teacher, unfortunately, I mean, well, many of our teachers are in their 60s, heading towards their 70s you know, we can lose a teacher over this. And, and is that worth opening a school up and having people die and then closing it back down? I don't know. I mean, that's, that's the, you, you yeah, it's yes. Kids are like the lowest chance to die from the virus, Yes, but we have families. Right. For instance, uh, I live with you. You are a boomer <laughs> who has respiratory issues. Yes. I'd rather you not die. <laughs> I would agree with that. I think most of my listeners would agree with that as well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, I'm young. If I if I cough up a lung for a few weeks, it's it's gonna hurt. It's gonna be bad. I might be, um, what is it called? Like, I'll have issues. I'll probably have issues for the rest of my life. Right. But it but it won't be as bad as losing one of my family members. Yeah. <laughs> so it's like you know. I guess I'd be okay with it, but also, you know, I have people well, the, to go home to. The sad part is, I mean, even people your age have died. So, I mean, yes, yeah. exactly. Oh, chance. oh, yeah. It's if a school opens and stays, die if yeah. you catch this, or that, like you said, you could have heart issues for the rest of your life, or exactly. another issue that that is uh, either exacerbated because of this, because of coronavirus, or you didn't have the issue before, and now you have that issue to deal with the rest of your life. And I wouldn't it, wish that on anybody. Yeah. It's, it's like a, if a school is open and it stays open, based off the death rate, it, most schools would have at least one student that dies. Right. And, and those are children. <laughs> oh, these are children. Yeah, one kid those, dying like... from your school being open should be enough for you to not have your school be open. And, like, we can get into, um, uh, you know, ba various school shooter topics on another day. Yeah. But, you know, I, I think we've, we've put kids in enough danger. <laughs> so, An acceptable level of dead children is no dead children. Yeah. 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 And that's what I think you got to look at when you, when you look at this and say, okay, especially the if – if they do come out with a vaccine as fast as they're looking like they might. I mean, if you open your schools and vaccines start to be, become available in November or December, and you had some grandparent of, of kids that died or some teacher died, and, you, and if you had just stayed with remote learning, that wouldn't have happened. And the, the vaccine by springtime or whatever it is, we have enough vaccine out there that, that we can reopen 100% of the way. Why uh, We waited this long. Why not wait a few more months? Yeah, just at the very least, wait until 2020 is over. Then start readdressing it. Yeah. But definitely don't open up anything until 2020 is over. Well, and certainly if, if these vaccines, if none of them work out, you're going to have to say, okay, how can we move on as a society? We're going to have to take more chances than we thought we were going to have to take. I mean, you're going to have to reevaluate everything at that point. But there's so many vaccines that are, they're trying out and they're going through massive trials now that any one or multiple of them might work just great and help out a lot and uh, save a lot of lives. So I think... Yeah, and I think there's, there's two things we need to consider, which is a lot of people might not want to take the vaccine. Correct. I, and, well, I, I thought about 30% of the people... <laughs> That they're not going to take the vaccine. Yeah. And um, the vaccine isn't really, it doesn't have to be the end goal. Uh, like New Zealand, Vietnam, they stopped getting new cases without a vaccine simply because of how, how quickly they shut down and how, uh, how hard they came after uh, disinfecting things, getting people tested, contact tracing, sure quarantined. Yeah. Yes. And so, like, 
we've we kind of given up on that. We can't do any of that. <laughs> yeah, we've given up on that. It wouldn't take long. It was just supposed to be two weeks of quarantine, but no one did that. Yeah. Or at least enough people didn't do it. Correct. That now we're in like month seven. Well, and they have to have fast enough testing that you can actually do the contact tracing because if your testing is not going to show up for a week or two, that's not going to help you. You need, you need it to be in a day or two or even faster. So hopefully they get that speed up. And uh, you, I, I just don't know. I don't, I, our country has it. They, the quote that they keep on saying over and over again is our country has had uh, a more difficult time with this and more people die and so forth than any of the um, advanced countries, right? Any of our sister countries, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And uh, and I think a big piece of that, unfortunately, is that a huge amount of the, not a huge, a decent size of the po- chunk of the population will either not take it seriously or not do the things that you have to do. They're not willing to give up on the things that they want to do. They want to have their parties or go to their have a bunch of people together and not have all the people that went to spring break, spring break, all of that kind of stuff. And as long as we're not going to have people that take it seriously and won't do the things they need to do, and we're not going to hold them accountable for, for not doing those things, we're probably going to keep on having setback after setback. Well, I think we also have, we can't put all of this on the individual considering that, you know, in Washington for a while we were, um, I can't remember what it's called. We were a hot spot, basically, yes, we were. because of, we early, had so early. many cases at the very beginning of it right. coming to the U.S. Um, but we, like, I mean, we we shut it down, Fast. and we had uh, essential services like seven pages long, um, just list after list of things that can stay open just for you know a little bit of entertainment. And so, yeah, I mean, GameStop was an essential service. Exactly. I mean, like, we, we didn't do great at, um, you know, shutting the economy down for two weeks and then letting it come back and flourish. We were right. so afraid of it falling that we were just kind of like, oh, well, people have to die, people have to die. And I can understand why people believe that and believe that, like, you know, this is like the economy and, uh, you know, the economic safety of our nation is more important than any one person. I don't personally believe that. Um, so I think that our elected officials kind of failed us as individuals um, when it comes to just our health and safety. Okay. Okay. I can see that. Um, I will say one of the things that I think helped Washington out is that a lot of the cases were centered around in clusters where they could kind of deal with them, uh, uh, nursing homes, that sort of thing. And, uh, and then we shut things down quick enough that it didn't get into the school system and so forth. Before yeah, that was lucky. Down. Yeah, it, so it was just, uh, uh, I want to say lucky, but it was lucky, fortuitous. It was that our folks were for, uh, forward enough thinking or concerned enough quick enough that they were able to deal with it fairly well. Uh, the problem now is, of course, it's probably as bad in the state as it was at its peak and yet uh we're having a hard time like shutting things down or anything because public sentiment is like no 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 we don't want to shut things down again we actually want to open things up and so they're really having to put on the brakes to just say okay well let's at least stay where we're at and i just don't feel like they're comfortable closing things down again like they probably should if they want to get a handle on it again but you know what are your thoughts about that with our state? We're Washington State, by the way, of course. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's it's pretty clear that we're not willing to shut it down again, which is unfortunate because people are going to die from this decision. <laughs> but um, I mean, we have a lot of essential services here that we can't we can't let go. I mean, um, we have so many Amazon centers. We had, I mean, in um, Eastern Washington, that was kind of a, a steady stream of new COVID cases since the very beginning. Um, 
they have way too many people working in factories to be able to properly social distance and to wear gloves and they've been protesting for it and they like just recently got a win in that where they were given PPE in order so that they wouldn't be spreading it to everyone every time they came to work. Right. Right. Huh. We're getting our wins slowly, but it's not it's not fast enough to save everyone that I think can be saved. Right. Yeah. The virus is spreading faster than the protective measures. Well said. Gotta say, Hunter, you haven't said as much as the two of us, but man, when you say something, it is uh, impactful. So I exist purely for good one-liners <laughs> and uh, visual ah. gags. <laughs> nice, nice job. Well, I think for this week, we'll probably stop there unless there's any other ground that you guys want to cover. Because uh, we have been on for quite a while, I think in at least an hour and a half or more. So yeah, you'll have some fun editing this one. <laughs> yes, <laughs> we covered or, so many different topics. I just topics. won't edit it. I can deal with it, but we'll we'll see. But anyway, thank you all for tuning in. If you've been watching us or listening to us on our podcast, um, certainly uh, tune into the podcast. We we try and bring you a few episodes every week, and next time we'll try and bring our friends back i loved having hunter here this time i think he's a nice job hunter alicia fantastic job as always uh hunter's over there with his he put something up says trans rights are human rights that's the tea sis (laughs) a a nice parting message for us i suppose so we will leave it at that um thanks everyone for tuning in and uh we will see you guys next week